we are very, very honored to have Professor Martinez, in whose name this award was created in Mexico, with us. Uh, and it, is, it gives me a great deal of pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Martinez today. The award was created by her colleagues at UNAM in recognition of her contributions to economics. Uh, Professor Martinez is an eminent economist, uh, has contributed extensively to the political life and landscape of Mexico, within Mexico and at the United Nations. I had the pleasure and also the frustration of, of reading a wonderful interview that she has given about her life. And when I say frustration, it's not finished. I asked her when we could read the sequel uh, to discover a great deal about Professor Martinez, her, her studies at Harvard, um, the, her work in, uh, in Cambridge, her meetings with, among others, uh, Joan Robinson, um, uh, Professor Hicks, um, and people that we read as, as, as graduate students. And those of us who studied at McGill were fortunate enough to meet uh, Joan Robinson, who came uh, to visit more than, uh, more than once. So I've been given the great pleasure, Professor Martinez, of welcoming you, of telling you that it is an extraordinary privilege to have you here with us. Thank you so much for uh, making the journey, and I would like to invite you to come and address our audience. And thank you all. Um, I, I will thank you again at the end, but thank you all for being here. We've gathered a, a really nice crowd uh, in the middle of August, uh, not the easiest time to organize um, an event. Professor Martinez, may I invite you to come forward? Professor Ipidenia Martinez from UNAM. Oh, may, I, may I please add that, that she was the first uh, director of the economics department uh, at UNAM, the Faculty of Economics. Welcome. School of Economics. Welcome. The National School of Economics that belongs to the National University of Mexico. First of all, thank you very much for this uh, welcoming. For me, quite undeserved, and, uh, but I had the, privil the privilege of uh, studying economics. Now I say that, but when I was a young uh, person, I didn't want to study economics. But, <laughs> but it's my father who almost <laughs> compelled me to do it. He said to me, uh, the, the level of living of the Mexican population has to be improved. And that's why political economy is for. So you go to study political economy. I wanted to go and study law. But uh, because of the, of the pressure of, of, my, of my father's I went to the National School of Economics. I don't regret it anymore because I had, had the opportunity of, of studying the writings of so many brilliant men and women, as you know all about the bibliography that we had to study for uh, economic theory, for economic history, and uh, well, all the rest, and economic regulation, the great variables and the manipulation of these variables by our progressive governments and by the market also, the market decisions and how they are led us try for not working for financing wars and financing and also supporting this, uh, the level of uh, the, so for the income distribution, those studies I also went a lot about income distribution and how it was determined by the market and how is the, it was determined by progressive economic policy, always trying, of course, to defend as many of, of, the, of the view that I see here, trying that the government action acts for a more equal distribution of income and to finance all the needs of a growing population, because the growing of population is one of the aspects of Mexico which has impressed me more. When I was, uh, I remember when I was young, we were 20 million people. Now we're more than 100 million people. I'm saying 110 or something like that, million people. Just imagine, more than five-fold the population has increased 
in a living, in a person living span. Well, that's too much providing. And now I think that the level of living is better now, at least for the majority of population, that when I was a child. So that's much uh, to the account of the political economists of my country and of the world, too. I mean, the political economic thought, which has been progressive, and which we read about the government intervention, Keynes and economics, and how the government, through the intervention in economic factors, can make a better distribution of income to provide for the social needs of the whole population, no matter what they're living, what their level of income is. Education for everybody, public health, and especially education and health, I would say. But of course, there's also housing, and then housing which is quite expensive because of ur urbanization. Well, as political economists here, you understand perfectly what I can say and how proud I am to having finally going to study political economy and to be here with you, our northern neighbors in Canada, far from Mexico City, but still with sympathetic views towards the economic development for everybody, and so that everybody has their social needs satisfied. That will make us, I am sure, a better country. Like we have a great admiration for Canada because of what you have achieved, and especially I want to thank you for uh, this uh, seminar that you're giving here today about globalization, financing, and development. I think these are three great uh, variables that go together, and to have a progressive view on that, and not forgetting about the rest of the world, but only in certain sense to have pr privileged Canadians here because of your hard work and because of your managing of your economics and your politics. I am very, very glad to be here, and thank you for this distinction. Uh, it's difficult to follow the footsteps of Evgenia, someone so important, I think, uh, in terms of her. Uh, I, you know, I read what Margie Mandel mentioned earlier, <laughs> uh, uh, that a sort of autobiography interview, and uh, it was just amazing, and I'm very proud to be with you here today. Uh, now, uh, what I would like to do is to begin with the first session uh, that, I that I will be chairing, and uh, to uh, uh, begin with uh, the first speaker of the session. Now, the session is on financing and development, and the first speaker is, uh, I, I want to literally follow through. I know perfectly well Jan, Jan Kriegel, uh, but I have, I was looking up for his, his uh, sort of CV here, and it's miles long here in a sense. Uh, so I won't even start to, to, to describe all that, except to say that he is currently, okay, he is the uh, director of research at the Levy Economics Institute. But he's held many, many positions over the years, very many. As I said, too many to want to list and, and go through here, except that I do want to mention something on a personal basis. I first met Jan. He may not remember. Perhaps he does. Uh, and I think there's also another person here, in this case, uh, uh, we had Myron Frankman, who drove me and another colleague at the time, another student, to the first conference I ever attended in the US at Rutgers University. It was the first post-Keynesian conference I ever attended. And it was in April of 1977, over 40 years ago. And at that conference, that's the first time I met Jan. Uh, Jan came. In fact, he was still on jet lag because he was working then for the Italian Employers Association, the Confindustria, where Guido Carli used to be the, uh, the chair or director of that, uh, uh, that uh, association. 
And he came and spoke on, if I remember correctly, something to do with Shrafa, but I can't remember the details. I wouldn't dare not talk. So it's been a long time, and I've seen him go through various phases of his own life in terms of research interests, but more importantly, also in terms of the kind of specific uh, uh, positions that he held, including, of course, a very important one, which was for the UN at the time in, in 2009, which was, of course, the, he was rapporteur of the, uh, of the, you know, at the time for the president of the UN, Kofi Annan, okay? uh, where, of course, it had to do with the commission on the reform of the international financial system. And I think what he's going to be talking about is very much connected with those issues. And the specific uh, topic that he will be speaking on is the double movement in the international financial markets, presumably taking a very Polanyi kind of perspective on that. Now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Jan to come and speak. Mario, thank you for reminding people that I cannot keep a job. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here. Particularly, I'm very pleased to be here in order to honor Caddy. And in order to honor Caddy, I'm also very pleased to be able to meet Professor Martinez again and also to reflect on Polanyi's idea in the great transformation of the so-called triad of fictitious commodities, something which, if you read it today, turns out to be incredibly current and incredibly important, I think, in trying to understand a number of the factors which are changing our current environment. In particular, Professor Martinez mentioned the problem of rising income inequality, and I, what I'm going to try to do today, or this morning, is to give a, a short reflection on how looking at the dual or the double movement in terms of the third of the triad of fictitious commodities in terms of money and finance has led very strongly to a well, very strong support for the income inequality that we currently see, as well as a political support for the income inequality that we see. If you look at it from this perspective, probably all of us are either dissatisfied or disturbed by the figures that we see in terms of the increasing disparity in incomes. But we also have to remember that there is a very strong current of political economy who looks upon this as a positive element in terms of supporting economic growth and in terms of supporting economic development. And I think it's incumbent on us to recognize that there are these two diverse approaches and to try and recognize the way to support what we believe to be the most appropriate position, and that is to try and make income equality more, or incomes more equal rather than more unequal. So if we start out, First point I'd like to make is that you now we look at, at the double movement. Well, the double movement is fine. This is a response to the impact of the market. But we can also look at this as a cycle theory. That is basically what the Great Transformation provides for us as an explanation of the movement and the removements across epochs of history. And we seem to be going through one of those movements and removements. So it's in this sense that I think the book is just as relevant today as it was in the conditions of the 1930s and the 1940s. The second is that it provides an idea of what I'll call hierarchy. 
Uh, I won't bother to read the quotation. There is, I did prepare a written, uh, a written piece for this. Uh, and in order to keep your attention, rather than putting up pictures so that you watch the pictures instead of listening to me, I'm just going to talk about it. Polanyi draws this distinction between these fictitious commodities, labor, land, noting that neither are labor and land produced by a means of production nor are they traded in real markets, so that it's in this sense that they're fictitious commodities. And then money comes afterwards as the third in the, what I call the triad. And if you read the book as I read it, money becomes the dominant force in the triad because it is in fact money that enforces the double movement. Without money there really would not be a very strong double movement. And this gets us to the point of being important for international relations. It's obviously when he talks about the role of money as a fictitious commodity, the actors in imposing the fictitiousness on money are in fact the gold standard and central banks. And the gold standard, as we know, is an international economic organization. It's an economic, international economic set of rules, and the central banks are, if you like, the enforcers. Today, what we have is, well, it's not necessarily a gold standard. We have an ersatz gold standard, and we have the IMF as the enforcer of this particular, uh, this particular relationship. So that the important thing is to look at how money plays that role in the modern context. And if we look at Polanyi's representation of money as a fictitious commodity, he draws a point very clearly. He says, the important thing is to realize that you have to conceive of money as, or current money, as simply being a sign that represents something that is physical. Now, what is that physical thing? Well, the physical thing is either a coin or implicitly it's gold under the gold standard. Okay? Now, if you read this as I did 30 years ago or more, it reads one way. If you read it today with the background of, what should I say, a great deal of recent study that I have been doing in terms of early 20th century German monetary theory, you can see here quite clearly the footprints of somebody called Ben Dixon. How many people have ever heard of Ben Dixon? Very few. It happens that his major book is in fact translated into Spanish, but it's not translated into English. Ben Dixon made one very simple point. Money is not gold. Gold has nothing to do with money. Forget about the link between money and gold. And if you read Polanyi, you can see behind this, Polanyi is saying, this is the way we should be thinking about money, but we have been perverted into believing that money is simply a sign that represents some physical commodity, and that's what makes it a fictitious commodity. Now, from Ben Dixon, we can go very quickly to Schumpeter, and we can also go to Knapp, because Ben Dixon was a supporter of Knapp. Now, those of you who are familiar with modern monetary theory, you know that God the Father of MMT is Georg Frederick Knapp. Okay? Now, whether you believe in MMT or not, this is not the important point. The important point is that if you read Schumpeter, Schumpeter will tell us that money is a social relation, it's not a commodity, and we have to get over the idea of starting out with the idea that money is something physical which then generates a pyramid or a credit structure. Schumpeter tells us that the pyramid is in fact that we normally draw is upside down. Okay? In fact, credit is at the bottom and money works its way up. So that in fact, what the Great Transformation tells us is a way to understand, I believe, what in fact is happening in terms of modern monetary theory, but also, more importantly, in terms of modern monetary systems. Now, if we look at the double movement, the double movement is what? Well, Paul says basically the double movement can be the response to the gold standard of introducing cheap money, okay? Or effectively going off the gold standard. 
Now, we know the double movement works how? The double, mo double movement works, imposing the gold standard creates massive unemployment, and governments eventually decide that they cannot put up with this anymore. So what do they do? They go off gold, or they create cheap money, or you get Williams Jennings Bryant, you're crucified on the cross of gold, let's monetize silver, okay? But this is something that really takes place, as we say, within this idea that somehow or other money is a sign relative to gold. So the double movement here is going from controlling the commodity to allowing the signs to inflate as fast as they want. In fact, Polanyi talks about this. He says, the big fear is that somehow or other these signs will be inflated beyond control. If you read Schumpeter, what does Schumpeter tell us? He says, the basic point of the development of the system is to allow these money signs to be inflated beyond control because this is what allows us to finance investment and allows us to finance new technical progress and allows us to grow. So. Schumpeter and Polanyi are in precisely the same range, okay? It's treating money as a commodity that prevents growth, but it also prevents the kinds of social responses to the difficulties that are created by the market. So in this sort of reading, what I'm giving, I'm saying is trying to place Polanyi, it, Polanyi in this broader context, Polanyi, we remember, most of us don't remember Ben Dixon, we don't remember Schumpeter, we don't remember this alternative monetary theory, which is the basis. Now, to get to the modern context, and Mario, tell me how long I have to do the modern context, five minutes, thank you, is that it raises, in a sense, a paradox. A paradox, why? Well, we have gotten rid of the gold standard. We still have the IMF and we have central banks. And we still have the market that imposes commodity discipline. Where? Well, if you happen to be a developing country and you have large capital inflows, which becomes the equivalent to cheap money, what happens? What happens is that eventually the sheriff, the IMF, comes along and reverses that movement and imposes conditions of the market on your domestic money supply, and it also imposes conditions on your fiscal policy. It says that what we have to do is to reverse this response by reimposing market discipline. It's the IMF, it's the central bank, whatever it does this. But if we look at the way the modern system works, how does the modern system work? Well, the modern system works in terms of what we call shadow banking. Did you see it? There it is. It's right behind me. The shadow, the shadow bank is everywhere. Imposing the market discipline does what? It creates the shadow. And what does the shadow do? The shadow creates cheap money. Okay? So that the double movement now is a double movement imposing market discipline on money only to have the market because those shadow bankers are doing what? They're following the profit motive. They're following the market. It's the market that is producing the expansion of liquidity that comes from shadow banking and provides the equivalent to cheap money. So we could say, on the one hand, this is great. Okay, the cheap money allows us to finance and support labor market policies, social policies, Okay, welfare policies. But does it? No. Where does it go? Where does that liquidity go that the shadow banks create? Where does that cheap money go? It goes to the other shadow bankers. And the shadow bankers become richer and richer and richer. They appropriate a larger and larger proportion of GNP. Where does that inequality come from that we see? The inequality comes from the operation of the market by the shadow bankers creating the counter movement. And this is where I started by saying there is a paradox here. A paradox in that the market creates the response that destroys 
the commodity nature of money, but at the same time then generates another counter movement because what do we do to stop the shadow bankers? To stop the shadow bankers, number one, we cut out social programs, we try to balance the budget, and we bail out the shadow bankers. Should we be surprised that we have an in increase in income inequality? Because the people who are paying for this are the people who are working in normally employed labor markets. Okay? So this is the paradox which the modern financial system has created for us internally and internationally. Okay? This increase in income inequality is not only domestic, it is also international. Why? Because the shadow bankers are also the ones who are shoveling the money to Brazil, to Argentina, to Mexico, which then creates the counter movement and the bailout and the income, in, income inequality. So the response is what? Well, I don't know. If you look at what Polanyi is telling us and you use this idea of commodity money, we should be number one, we should not be surprised that income inequality increases. Secondly, we should not be surprised. Why? Because this is precisely what we find in the work of Friedrich Hayek and the other parts of the Austrian tradition who when they discovered that banks could in fact increase signs without limit, created policies such as 100% reserve banking and other things which do what? They precisely serve to make money behave as if it is a commodity. And why do they do this? Because they believe the inequality that you generate in this way is positive for economic development. If you read Hayek's work, Hayek says what? He says, look, in a random population there are going to be some smart people and some dumb people. Okay? The smart people are the ones we want. We want to reward them. Okay? Read the Constitution of Liberty. We believe in income inequality. The smart guys should have all the money. They should run the government. Why? Because if you look at the workers, okay, people who are in labor occupations, what do they do? They just do the same thing over and over and over again. They become like rote robots. They can't have insight. They can't support innovation. So we don't want them to participate. We shouldn't give them any money because they'll just spend it and we shouldn't allow them to be part of the government because they have no idea. All they'll do is to try and transfer income to themselves. And this is a big waste because it doesn't finance innovation. It doesn't finance growth. So what we want, we should defend inequality. Okay? Now, that's the other side of the story. So you have Polanyi on one side telling you the story that in order to generate development you need a double movement and in order for that double movement to work you have to be able to defend against the Hayekian alternative which says that the double movement is not good. Now obviously I think most of us have one position on this and I think it's important to recognize that what we're seeing today is a double movement of response driven primarily by number one by finance and secondly by interestingly enough the Silicon Valley innovators okay they're very happy that they're part of the 0.05 percent of the income distribution that has 95 percent of the population that has 95 percent of the income because Hayek tells them that they deserve it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jan. Uh, actually, I was uh, allowing maybe a couple of questions, that's why, uh, and then we're going to uh, quickly move uh, on. And at the end, we'll try to reserve 10, 15 minutes for a more general discussion with the, you know, among the three. So are there any questions uh, for Jan? Sorry, I went over time, I think. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, please. <laughs> uh, is there any transfer of uh, wealth going directly, not only from uh, work, but uh, uh, also from natural uh, environmental uh, external contributions to the economy in this, in this discussion? OK, it's, this is a very interesting question. When I was preparing the, the write-up, now, obviously, most of our discussion is always in terms of labor. Okay, land doesn't come directly into it. Once we recognize, what do I say, generally ecological and environmental problems, then we also have the role that land, in fact, plays in this entire triad. Now, I picked on the finance part of it. And it's the finance relative to labor. The same thing is also true in terms of ecological and environmental relationships. That is, the attempt to defend, I mean, you can, you can make a case, if you like, that part of the double movement as it relates to land is the ecological environmental response. Okay? which again is not something that's recent. I mean, you can go back to Franklin Roosevelt, who was probably the first of the environmentalists in, uh, in the United States. But very clearly, there is also, at that level, a similar sort of transfer. Because if you look at the kinds of programs that we have normally set up, I won't go through them all, just you know, reflect carbon taxes in terms of offsets and things of this sort. Primarily, these things are set up in order to generate income transfers to the financial sector. Okay? We can give you examples of companies that go buy up particular companies or particular land in order to generate the credits which they can then resell into the market. So that yes, there is a, an entire separate, uh, separate discourse that we can make in terms of the impact of finance as dominating the double movement in, as it relates to land. But in this case, it's much more than simply land tenure or land ownership. This is in terms of, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the, the custody of environmental resources. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, maybe one more, I'll allow if uh, there's a short one. If not, we'll go on, and we could get back to that, uh, as I said at the end, with some discussion more generally. Okay, one more. Okay. okay. Okay, that's a short question that has a very long answer. Uh, <laughs> Okay, basically, digital currencies are not and cannot be money in the sense of Ben Dixon or anybody else because money also always has to be a debt credit relationship. If you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is what? It's just a journal, okay? It's a transaction journal and it just shows what moves from one to the other. If you look at the way it was designed, it was designed in order to reflect as closely as possible a commodity money, okay? So that one of the problems, well, kind of the current problems that you see in terms of the Bitcoin manufacturing is that you have the point that eventually there is a limit. Now, you run out, just as you would run out. You know, we thought we were going to run out of gold. You're going to run out of Bitcoins. So the miners said, um, hello, there's a problem here. Because if we run out, then what do we do? Okay? Think of yourself as a miner. Okay? If you can't mine anymore, what's the point? The system basically will collapse. So at that stage, eventually a Bitcoin is going to have to do what it basically did, is to find a way in order to get over that limit. Now, the shadow, that's what shadow banks do. They get over the limits that the central bank imposes uh, on the creation of money. So the split in the miners is a way of getting over the fact that Mr. Nakimoto, or whatever his name is, put in terms of the total, uh, total expansion of Bitcoin. So it's in that sense that Bitcoin is basically a fictitious commodity. And we know that fictitious commodities, as I say, will be subject to the same type of response as we had with the shadow bankers, which means that you know, there will be a lot of people holding Bitcoins that end up getting very rich. And there'll be a lot of people holding bitcoins that will lose a whole lot of money, and it will not be any different than the systems that we've seen up to now. Okay. Okay. I'll stop there, and I'll uh, now ask the second speaker here. 
uh, Alicia Guillon, who will uh, be talking on globalization and financialization, stakeholders' development, and human rights. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, really, we are very uh, happy to be here with Kari Polangi and also with Ifigenia. And it is a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I want to confess something. Uh, when Mario invited me, I thought it was going to be a very easy to write a paper and to make a PowerPoint about the title that he gave me, Globalization and Financialization, Stakeholders, Development, and Human Rights. And he changed a little the title, and while I was writing the paper, uh, I, I thought, well, why I didn't tell him to have another title? Because it really had been very difficult to me to express my feeling about, especially about the stakeholders and the shareholders. Mm. And uh, I'm really sorry, I'm going to um, read some uh, paragraphs of this paper. I hate to, to, to read, but I am going to do like in this way, because there have been a lot of ideas in my head, and, and I'm going to try to be, at, at least you just tell me when it is my time. Well, during my participation in the United Nations High-Level Panel for Women Economic Empowerment, established to address the specific economic issues that affect women and to support the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, I decided to participate in one of the seven drivers of that document, Leave No One Behind, a Call to Action for Gender Equality and Women's Economic Empowerment closer to my economic and finance research where I had been working since more than three decades ago. In my opinion, driver four, building assets, digital, financial, and property is one of the most important drivers, not only because money is important in a monetary production economy, but also because credit is the base to reach economic development. However, what lies behind the fourth driver in the final document is the relation between stakeholders, shareholders, and the microfinance institution. However, financial and digital inclusion is to institutional investors the link through globalization and finalization of microeconomic and microeconomic policies. Therefore, microfinance institutions and microcredits are not the behavior of society, is what according to Carpolangi, the dislocation of the fabric of society as a result of the high profits obtained by the scandal interest rates charged by these microfinance institutions through microcredits to relieve poverty and reach women economic empowerment as a human right. There are many heterodox studies show the failure of these financial policies, especially the returns uh, that uh, Bateman and Chuck and Chang and Ha Ho Chang has produced. Uh, other, uh, while I was uh, writing, I also was reading again the Great Transformation, uh, fr uh, from the Great Transformation to the Great Financialization of, of Kari and also the book of Carl Polanyi. So there is a close relations between how the stakeholders and shareholders are now in our society. And I would like to say that, well, the first, uh, I divided in two blocks the, the paper. And the first one is about the stakeholders and shareholders building financial assets. The new organization of capitalism after the New Deal is explained by Minsky, and Bis Minsky called this new stage the supremacy of money manager capitalism, where the shift to maximization of share prices as one of the main goals of management, which supposedly aligned the interests of shareholders and top managers who receive stock options in compensation. 
the word stakeholders appears in all the documents of the high-level panel recommendations focused mainly on the four driver. Recommendations to reach gender equality in the other, because there are two, two uh, papers, leave no one behind, taking action for transformational change on women's economic empowerment, are building assets, digital, financial, and property to ensure women's equal access to G digital financial services and equal access to and control over productive resources, including land, labor, <clears throat> and capital, and encourage stakeholders to assess how women in the country for progressing along the digital inclusions continuum. <clears throat> I'm not going to read the definition that uh, 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 and, and, uh, and how Freeman um, explains what uh, about the stakeholder theory. But one of the things that I want to confess that when we were discussing how to regulate the interests that are charged by the microfinance institution for micro for, for microcredits uh, for women, one of the persons that were behind me said. Alicia, you just can't put that because uh, they won't like, especially for t uh, the stakeholders of, or the shareholders. And they say, well, what's going here? Well, the thing is that in these documents, the central aim of the stakeholders is inside, and one of the principles of this, the shareholders' principle is to maximize the shareholder value. So, uh, Lasonic mentions that the central to the MSB, maximum shareholder values argument, is the assumption that, all, all, that of all participants in the business corporations, shareholders are the only economic actors who make productive contributions without a guaranteed return. All other participants, such as creditors, workers, suppliers, and distributors allegedly receive a market determined price for the goods or services that they render to the corporations and hence take no risks or whether the company makes or loses money. On this assumption, the very definition of free cash flow includes corporate earnings that under a retained and reinvest resource allocation regime the corporations would have invested in training, retaining, and rewarding employees. And on this assumption, only shareholders have an, ec an economically justifiable claim to the residual or revenues over cost after the company has paid all other shareholders their guaranteed contractual claims for their productive contributions to the firm. If predominates the M is the argument, shareholders are the only stakeholders who need the incentive to bear the risk of investing in productive resources that may result in superior economic performance. From a neoliberal perspective, a stakeholder theory contributes to focus studies of human rights, environmental protection, and sustainable development between the close relationship to stakeholders with administrative organization of the company and the shareholders. Research works on the contrary sees, and this is a, a quotation of Randall Ray, says that by the early 2000s is the coalescence of three phenomena that made the biggest financial institutions extremely dangerous. The return of pump and dump strategies, ripping of customers and shareholders, the move from partnerships to corporate form, which increases the agency problems, institutions run in the interest of management, not owners, and excessive executive compensation that was tied to short-term performance, which increases the pressure to cheat or to do anything else that justifies huge bonuses. What we do found is that stakeholders and shareholders is a language inserted in the process of globalization and financialization, not only 
of the Agenda 2030 and the aim, but also in the aims of the International Monetary Fund, the financial markets, and the central bank monetary, fiscal, and financial policies. All the economy is immersed in the predominance of the corporation to maximize shareholders' value, and Kelsey will portray this flow couch out of companies to the stock markets as a return of capital to shareholders who will then reallocate capital to its best alternative use, uses. What is behind of the fourth driver is the link between, as I already said, the microfinance institutions and institutional, institutional investors that are part of this globalization process. So the transformation of these institutions these big uh, organizations since the 70s on the, until the great crisis, 2008, is the penetration of the stakeholders in our lives. It is not a casual issue that central banks, monetary and fiscal policy, and austerity programs after the great crisis are related with high profits in the financial markets. A stakeholders' development has been empowered by the increased corporation profits that trade in the Wall Street during the neoliberalist per, uh, period. Then, in the, second, uh, uh, in the second part of this paper, I dominated financialization and the framework of financial and digital inclusion. One of the fundamentals of economic, uh, political, and social thinking in the reformulation of public policies is intimately related to the dominance of institutional investors, estranged since the mid 1970s. The, uh, the actions that continue the transformation at a global level of corporate governance were expressed in the access of the economic reforms of the Washington consens Consensus. As Kari Polanyi mentioned, transnational corporations have become increasingly powerful and influential in the formulation of public policy. They finance, and Kari says in, his, in, in her book, they finance the think tanks and university that furnish the political directorates of the OECD with a neoliberal political agenda of globalization. The rearticulation of neoliberalist ideological thinking along financialization and globalization deepened the relationship of a totally encrusted society in its own destruction. The reduction of employment facing profound technological changes and the lack of coherence between the robotization and technological innovation is one of the principal goals in our society. Uh, in, the, in the extent that, and this is a quotation of Carl Polanyi, I will read it, is that progressive financialization of capital has substituted short-term market based consideration of shareholders' value for the long-term strategic planning horizon of corporations producing for mass market. In this Anglo-American variety of capital aims, finance has become decoupled from production and the capital market has lost its useful function of judging the long-term productive capabilities of different firms. Once a criterion of shareholder value became the objective of good management of co a company, the capital market became a gigantic casino where people attempted to guess the market with confidence that it would maintain a secular rising trend of all the aspects of globalization, it is the financialization of capital that has had the most profound cons consequence in the West. I will have more <laughs> reading, but I think it's only uh, you only have a couple of minutes. One minute. minutes left. Well. Okay. Well, uh, later I would like to finish with a quotation because what's going here is all the change in the technological economy now called the digital economy, and that's why it is very important to share this concept of financial and digital inclusion, because it is very related with all these financial organizations, and especially also with the central bank uh, policies and the International Monetary Fund. And I'm going to read what it says 
uh, it's a quotation of the, uh, I'm going to read it. It's a quotation of um, the president of the University of Nairobi, who was previously the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. He says that digital financial services not only contributes to financial development, they also support financial stability with less need for cash for transactions, more economic agents can send and follow financial market signals contributing to a more solid and vibrant financial system. The environment for monetary policy improves as a result. So all these languages that we have very close in our lives and all this new uh, language that it is behind the Agenda 2030, we have to uh, read it very carefully because it is very well related with the shareholders and stakeholders uh, um, of, especially of the big finance corporations and also of the institutional uh, investors. Um, they have also, it is very important that, that during the last G20 summit in Hamburg, in Hamburg, they also have a language, they have also a lot of speeches about this, the digital economy, but they have specified about, uh, 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 very close to the uh, digital, uh, uh, financial and digital uh, inclusion. Uh, thank you very much for those, uh, that presentation. And I was wondering if microfinance also uh, has lost some of its historic background because it originally came out of Bangladesh during socialism. Yeah. And it, microfinance was assuming a so, uh, the end of private ownership of the means of production and end of private ownership of capital. So maybe microfinance needs a different framework completely to, in order to be implemented effectively to have empowerment for all people. I just wanted to know if you had some thoughts about Bangladeshi socialism. Oh, well, uh, there are a lot of studies about the failure of this, uh, uh, especially in, I would say, in, uh, all this bank that uh, for microfinance. And of course, it is uh, sometimes when you see, uh, for example, in Bolivia, uh, we had been there and we have seen how many these uh, indigenous people, especially because microcredit is especially for women not only for men. When you see the databases of these microcredits all around the world, most of the microcredits are for, for, uh, for women. But when you relate the profits that microfinance institutions have, they are, uh, in comparative with the commercial banks, they are higher. And if you compare the interest rates of these microfinance institutions, they are higher than the commercial banks. So what we have, and it is written in a paper that Eugenia Correa and we have written, is that you find that women are very profitable. It is uh, how this came, because when you erase the development banks, in, especially in underdeveloped countries, be, uh, after all the finance, um, deregulation and liberalization process, especially in financial sectors, what you have found is the newborn of these institutions. But that's not only the principal thing. These institutions are very well related with the financial markets, and they are related, all, most of the money that arrives to these microfinance institutions came from the child banking and from the, and also from big banks. Um, there are a lot of, uh, Shank, uh, Ha Ho Shank uh, has a book written with Bateman, and also Bateman has wrote a lot about this, uh, of the failure of this microcredit. It's, uh, that the thing is how they use the language for women economic empowerment for this, uh, to, to take these credits. It's good to have a credit, of course it is, but why they aren't given by development banks or by the governments 
to apply for productive sectors and also if the productive sectors fails, you, you don't have to be um, paying that uh, high credit. There are, um, it is not the, especially the, these microcredits are not only for one person. Most of the time they are for five or 10 persons. If you just can pay, then the community will pay for it. So there's a lot of papers written about microfinance, and also there is a lot of, uh, of course, there are some um, uh, um, projects that has been uh, uh, very well. They, they are, you no, know, they have a lot of stars, but most of them, especially in the very, very poor sectors, they haven't improved their lives. So, and this has been, uh, we have seen this in Bolivia, even in uh, India. So the, the principal thing is that relation of these little credits with the shareholders of the big companies. Uh, the third speaker, uh, in fact, uh, was speaking earlier there, <laughs> is Joanna uh, Bachman, uh, who is a associate professor uh, in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at George Mason uh, University in the U.S. And Joanna has interest in, uh, again, in areas relating to banking and also to, uh, actually I was just reading this, uh, one, uh, her book, uh, she has a book called Markets in the Name of Socialism, The Left-Wing Origins of Neoliberalism. And uh, indeed, I would be most interested in, <laughs> in hearing about some of that. Uh, but she will be speaking on banking as solidarity, east-south, south-south financial connections, and globalization. So Joanna, <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> it's a, really a pleasure to be here, such an exciting event. and. Um, and I'm actually uh, really excited about the panelists in the audience because you guys are all the people that I want to be in dialogue with for this project, so it's wonderful to be here. Several years ago, I decided to translate Karl Polanyi's 1922 article called Socialist Accounting from German to English, which brought me into contact with Carrie Polanyi Levitt. This fateful decision led to a many-year saga in which many other people got involved, including two tra other translators, Ariana Fisher and David Woodruff. Um, they joined in this translation, and it's a beautiful translation that resulted um, and was published. During this saga, I was exceedingly lucky to be able to speak directly with Carrie. She was incredibly insightful about her father's work and also its implications in many, many different ways. She and I share a central European perspective on Karl Polanyi's work. I have adopted this perspective because I have long studied Hungarian and Central European economic thought. Uh, Carrie and I share an understanding of the influence of many Central European socialisms on Karl Polanyi's thinking. The article, Socialist Accounting, laid out his vision of a socialist society, the clearest formulation that I have ever read. After a brief explanation of these ideas, I will talk about how these ideas relate to banking as solidarity. Socialist accounting appeared in 1922 in the Archive for Sozialwissenschaft and Sozialpolitik as a response to an article by Ludwig von Mises. In, the, in his article, Mises argued that socialism was impossible because in a socialist society, calculation was impossible. Polanyi set out to explain that socialism, in fact, was possible. For Polanyi, socialist, account, uh, socialist calculation could not take place so much at the individual level of either the consumer or the, social plan, the central planner, but rather this socialist calculation had to happen democratically. It happened at the social level. Polanyi understood socialism as a radical extension of democracy into the, into the economic sphere. Basically, Polanyi envisioned that a socialist society would abolish private ownership of the means of production and would retain markets, money, and prices. These markets would be, as we've heard many t couple times already, these markets would, uh, were commodity markets, but not markets in fictitious commodities. So the, they would not be markets in land, labor, or capital. Polanyi's understanding of the market in socialism was quite novel. 
every person would be involved in a number of professional associations representing their ideas as in their workplace or for other interests they had, and that they would seek maximum productivity, and that they would also be involved with the commune. The commune would represent their non-work interests and would seek social justice. In contrast to Mises's uh, uh, market of isolated individuals negotiating prices, in Polanyi's market, a wide variety of producer associations and communes negotiated prices. Polanyi thus demonstrated how markets could be embedded in or even constituted of democratic, un in democratic institutions controlled by producers and consumers. So how might banking then be socialist in a Polanyian way? I've conducted research into the economic ideas and more specifically the financial ideas of the non-aligned movement, especially that at UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development. And Kerry has been very much involved in this uh, institution. In addition to studying the, this research about UNCTAD and their archives in Geneva and New York, I'm now conducting research on two different banks. Uh, these are very unique banks, and one is called the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation, and this other bank is the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or otherwise known as the notorious BCCI, which was one of, declared one of the most corrupt banks in the entire world. And this has a different history that I'm not going to go into today, but I see them both as non-aligned banks. Today I'll talk briefly about the Yugoslav Bank. Um, basically these uh, banks, both these banks did not privileged profit, but rather gave priority to solidarity and to economic cooperation among developing countries, and at least the Yugoslav Bank was a socialist bank. In the 1950s and 1960s, such countries as Egypt, Ghana, India, Indonesia, and Yugoslavia, among others, fun, uh, founded the non-aligned movement, calling for developing countries to align with each other rather than the United States or the Soviet Union. Moving beyond calls for development aid, non-aligned countries instead work to restructure world trade, production, finance, and markets to forge new channels outside long-standing colonial paths. In uh, the colonial world economy, goods and services had flowed between the colonies and their respective metropoles, while moving rarely between colonies, as Carrie her house, her, has also discussed. In these colonial bilateral relationships, colonies produced raw materials for production processes that often took place in the core industrial countries. A new system required multilateral as opposed to colonial bilateral relationships, institutions, and rules. And that this kind of global action required uh, action rather than laissez-faire, um, rather than a laissez-faire approach on many levels. Action at the national, regional, interregional, and international levels. As part of the non-aligned restructuring, Capital flows and debt. Would I be able to have this water? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> As a part of non-aligned restructuring, capital flows and debt began to flow among geographies created by socialist and non-aligned forms of, of globalization. Thus, many debtor countries were also creditors. Most importantly, non-aligned countries sought to trade with each other and thus owed each other a great deal of money. Some of these flows can be seen in debt documents. So in this, uh, this is a World Bank document for Ethiopia uh, dealing with their uh, late 1990s debt. You can see that the, uh, these show the former Yugoslavia, um, Poland, Libya, Korea, uh, Democratic Republic, People's Republic of Korea, and so on are uh, retained debt that is not being paid off. The debt is being paid primarily first to um, the first world countries, and then also that debt is being paid. You can see the United States is paid off, um, and the lower, it's all zeros in 1998, whereas uh, the former Yugoslavia has not been paid off um, their debt. And so we see this um, happening in many places. Um, this is a um, HIPC initiative. You can see here also the uh, non-aligned movement connections between Nicaragua, Czech Republic, Egypt, Tanzania, and so on. These are debt that is not yet paid off, and so um, we can see that the debtor countries are also creditor countries. 
Um, UNCTAD had uh, assisted in creating new kinds of international financial cooperation institutions that would create new capital that would be controlled and owned by the non-aligned world. And in this, here what we have is, um, these are different kinds of financial co uh, cooperation, which I'm not going to go into, but we can see that there were attempts at payment arrangements and trade financing, development financing. This money was supposed to be controlled by the developing countries. Um, and some of the important uh, innovations that were attempted were um, banks of the global south were attempted and attempts at new kinds of currency in order to um, allow for global trade in a way that would be fundamentally different than capitalism. So here I'm going to talk just briefly about this Yugoslav institutions that were trying to create a new global economy built on solidarity as well as on markets, money, and prices as an integral part of the new international economic order. Yugoslavia was committed until its demise. It was committed to international economic cooperation and international financial cooperation. On January 1st, 1980, the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation began operations as a non-aligned bank and as a socialist bank. Since 1956, Yugoslavia had a export bank. It was called Yuga Bank. It was a commercial bank that financed Yugoslav exports. In 1968, Yuga Bank was converted into the Export Credit and Insurance Fund, which provided supplementary credit financing for exports. This fund thus provided money to other Yugoslav banks to finance Yugoslav companies that wanted to export their goods. This fund also insured exports against non-commercial risk. And so this was very important in the 1980s to have this insurance because there was a lot of political risk around the world. The new Yugoslav Bank for U International Economic Cooperation also had a third task, a new task of international financial cooperation. According to its founding law, the Yugoslav Bank was created to realize the goals of the 1976 Non-Aligned Summit in Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka, which sought the development of international, uh, national, regional, and international economic organizations, which should contribute to achieving the policy of speeding up development of non-aligned countries and developing countries. The Yugoslav government formed the Yugoslav Bank to work with other organizations internationally and to, um, to build international financial cooperation. This bank did not contribute to financialization. In financialization is the idea of economies being reoriented away from production and towards speculative financial investments. This was rather a bank that provided finance in the service of expanding production and expanding economic cooperation worldwide. I'll come back to this in just a second. This Yugoslav bank, though, was a socialist bank, and it reflected specifically the Yugoslav model of worker self-management socialism. After the Yugoslavs were kicked out of the Soviet bloc in 1948, the Yugoslav government developed worker self-management socialism in opposition to the Soviet state model and also in opposition to the US state model. In 1974, the Yugoslav government took the, its socialist model to a new level. Its new constitution implemented a new, more participatory form of planning. They broke up enterprises into small, basic organizations of associated labor within each firm. These uh, organizations were relatively small and were supposed to be independent of each other and the firms they were part of. They created their own plans and they were then integrated into a larger nationwide social plan, thus making planning more participatory. Economists, however, in Yugoslavia were incredibly critical of this reform. The founders and members of the Yugoslav Bank for International Economic Cooperation were these basic associations, uh, basic organizations of associated labor. These organizations exported capital goods. They were, for example, shipyards that made large cargo ships that they sold to Liberia and to Panama and other countries around the world. They were other producers, exporters, and commercial banks. These organizations all signed the association that created the Yugoslav Bank, and they provided the funding for the Yugoslav Bank. By the 1980s, there were over 200 members of this bank which contributed, contributed the funds and ran the bank through self-management uh, committees. Thus, the bank was a self-managed socialist bank. In line with Karl Polanyi's thinking, the bank extended and deepened economic democracy. 
this Yugoslav bank had several means to provide finance in the name of solidarity. The bank opened in an extremely uh, difficult situation if we think about the 1980s. First of all, Tito passed away, the, um, the, the most important leader of this uh, socialist model. He died in 1980, the year that the bank opened. Internationally, Yugoslavia's main market for its exports was the developing world, but it was also this developing world was in a massive uh, debt crisis. The policy of the bank was to encourage long-term economic cooperation with these countries, which meant that the bank had to look for new means to continue production and trade. Uh, so for example, and this will be very familiar to people involved with development finance, this kind of what they did. One, for one example, in 1980, a Yugoslav firm called uh, Vozila Gorica built a factory in Tanzania. Um, this factory uh, assembled trailers for trucks and for agricultural equipment. The Yugoslav Bank uh, provided supplementary export financing and insurance to enable this long-term production co cooperation. The Yugoslav firm transferred without payment the technological rights and all the engineering to the Tanzanians. They did not get paid for that. And they trained all of the Tanzanian personnel to run the factory. The Tanzanian State Motor Company purchased the trailers from the factory each year, and the trailers were sold elsewhere in Africa as well. From the Yugoslav side, the factory was very successful and was an ideal example of cooperation between two non-aligned countries. I believe that this, this factory was in operation at least until 1996, and it may still be in operation today. This is a good example of long-term uh, economic and financial cooperation. However, in 1983, the Tanzanian government could, pay, could, only, uh, could only pay for the trailers in local currency. They didn't have any hard currency to pay the Yugoslavs. So the Yugoslav company couldn't actually pay the Yugoslav bank back. So to resolve this problem, the Yugoslav company accepted payment in kind through barter. Uh, they uh, uh, accepted Tanzanian export commodities such as cotton, zizel, hides, and coffee to for in payment in, uh, for the trailers. And then to obtain hard currency to pay back the Yugoslav bank, the Yugoslav company then traded the hides to another Yugoslav bank that was dealing with leather. And so they were able to pay back the bank. However, this all changed when structural adjustment programs went into effect and the Tanzanian government then wanted to have its own hard currency to pay back its primary, what it per perceived as its priority lenders. So the Yugoslav Bank, though, aside from these problems, worked on a variety of barter forms in order to maintain its relationships of trade with um, its, uh, its, the countries it was allied with. And, to, they, and it sought to also, they, some of the other things they did is they had 0% uh, interest rate, zero interest rate loans, they had reduced loans, they had long payment of loans, they also, they had, um, and they did have a lot of a variety of experiments. The Yugoslav Bank also sought to have um, global connections. They, um, they financed a wider range of subsidiaries and uh, joint ventures during the 1980s. Uh, here's a, in the 1980s, here's a list of some of the countries they were doing joint ventures with. You can see there's a variety of USA, Mexico, Pakistan, Ghana, Greece, and these are just their subsidiaries and joint ventures that they're organizing. Um, and Uh, this is just uh, the amount, the countries they're providing insurance for exports. We can see that it's 48 countries in 1981, so they're just starting a year into this um, program at they, this, this bank. So you can see it's quite global, and they were expecting and hoping it to be even more global over time. Um, so it, also through the 1980s, the Yugoslav Bank provided financing for a variety of countries that had lost financing elsewhere. One of their big uh, countries that borrowed from, uh, that was uh, borrowing from them was Peru. So along with socialist and non-aligned banks, the Yugoslav Bank was an innovator and generator of global banking. But global banking, I think, is only possible through socialism and through non-alignment and not through capitalism. But finance was intended, this finance of the Yugoslav Bank was intended in the service of production and solidarity, not in the service of profit and speculation. The Yugoslav Bank reflected the worker self-management socialism and the non-aligned visions of the Yugoslav government and the non-aligned movement. 
The 1980s debt crisis, however, co-opted and reshaped this globalization, strengthening neo-colonial north-south flows. The literature on the debt crisis focus, focuses primarily on debt owed to the first world and does not recognize the enormous debt that was owed to the second and third worlds. Yugoslavia had significant debts owed to, the, owed to it in part because of its, its extensive international cooperation. By 1984, Yugoslav banks and enterprises were owed $2.4 billion by the foreign countries. Nearly 74% of this debt owed to Yugoslavia was owed by Asian, African, and Latin American countries. The largest third world debtors to Yugoslavia in the 1980s, at the, by the end of the 1980s, was Liberia, which owed almost $500 million. Algeria owed almost $150 million. And Peru owed $115 million to Yugoslavia. In Yugos uh, and the issue is, is that Yugoslavia was not paid back until very, very recently. Um, that they did, did not allow for payment to go back to Yugoslavia, which became, took, which was actually the mantle of Yugoslavia was taken on by Serbia until Milosevic uh, was taken from power. Then Serbia was paid back um, parts of this debt. The Soviet Union was also owed much more than it, uh, that it owed any other country, and it was not paid back until much later as well. It is still being paid back today. Um, we should recognize that socialist and non-aligned countries were developing financial and economic systems with markets, money, and prices, but that they prioritized production, export, and solidarity. Yugoslavia also prioritized economic democracy. These countries were also both creditors and debtors. Recognizing this, this um, brings to light the fact that socialist and non-aligned worlds actively globalized as a form of solidarity, helping to create a global economy, which was then co-opted by the capitalist world. Banking in the service of production, export, solidarity, and radical democracy could be seen as part of a Polanian form of socialism. Thank you. When uh, you mentioned uh, the investment in trailer assembly in Tanzania by the Yugoslavian bank, uh, <clears throat> I was just interested in knowing if you have any uh, information about how appropriate this technology was, because there's a number of great issues in Tanzania mm -hmm. in terms of uh, inappropriate technology. Thank you. That's a, yeah, that's a very good question. I have to say that the, the information that I have about this is only from the Yugoslav side. Um, so I don't have information what the Tanzanian government at this point, what they thought about this technology. The th um, this was, uh, but that at least in the spirit of it, uh, Yugoslavia perceived itself as a developing country and that it was, it perceived itself um, at, on a similar terrain as Tanzania and therefore was trying to um, work, they saw themselves as equals and so that may improve situations, it may just may be more problematic because then they, maybe they can't see the problems that they're causing. So it's, um, it's that quest to answer that question, I'd have to do more research in the, in the actual Tanzanian government archives to see. Thank you. A couple of questions um, which are related. I found Joanna's presentation quite inspiring, and it provokes the thought that perhaps it's time to revisit the possibility of, of national banks, publicly owned national banks. Um, and it's quite clear that all over the world, including in our own country, we have national publicly owned banks. In our case, it's the Business Development Bank of, of Canada. Uh, Germany has a very famous one, the KFW, Credit Anstalt für Wiederaufbau. And um, so my question is, should we uh, at this conjuncture be thinking of bringing back national publicly owned development banks in developing countries uh, so that they can finance infrastructure and projects uh, in their own country. Secondly, um, would it, is it fanciful to think of a return to the Bretton Woods system, which was much more stable, much more friendly towards equitable growth, uh, but very uh, dependent on restraining capital flows, international capital flows? It was the end of restraints on capital flows, which, in my view, led to the downfall of the Bretton Woods system. So uh, is, is this something that can be contemplated? If so, how could we help to bring it about? Thank you. Uh, 
I, yeah, I just have one comment about the, the restraining of international capital flows. The only issue is, is that I think that, um, I think also that Sipal was, um, and uh, Raul Prebish was kind of, they were interested, at least in the documents I read in the UNCTAD archives, in not having restrained capital flows, uh, because there might be actually the, you want to have specific, you want to have the developing world investing in, its, in each other. So having international flows of capital isn't necessarily the problem. The problem is, is it's, it's owned by major banks that are interested in profit. So if you had like a regional, I mean the, 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 the kind of utopia was that, is that these development banks were supposed to be you know, actually keeping capital local or keeping capital in the region and not letting it be taken away. And I, and I actually, I, I mean, I've always assumed that didn't happen, but I, maybe development banks did something different than, than other banks. But um, I, I don't know if that's, I don't know whether you guys are much more informed than I am on that part. Um, but the national, uh, <coughs> the public national banks are really popular right now in the U.S. There's a discussion about the, about doing this, and, but it's how, whether it will happen is a big question. Yes, uh, another question there, and there's another down there as well. Um, I would like to thank all of you first and foremost for your respective presentations, and I have a question that's specifically directed at Alicia. I would like to know, in your experience, is there anything about the digitalization of finance that should make it lead towards uh, less unequal development and fairer forms of distribution? Because I feel that it's always depicted as something that's uh, a beacon of hope and so on, but it's never specifically um, said why should it technically. Is there any, anything that's intrinsically fair about it? Thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I, I would like to answer the first and the second, can I? Well, <laughs> the first one is that development banks are very important uh, for underdeveloped countries, and especially if you study how uh, Japan, after the um, uh, Second War, uh, has a development, is because they have a very strong development banks. If you study the Chinese financial system, you are going to find that uh, when they make the, the when they establish the central bank, the popular Chinese. Uh, Republic, uh, the, what is it, PBOZ, the Popular Bank of China, which is the central bank. They also est establish three principal banks to have the development, and besides that, they have the commercial banks, and they open also for foreigners the financial system. I think development banks is the key to have development and a better, and a better uh, distribution, and if you want to have a development, an economic development, and sustainable development, or whatever you want, but if you want to have a better society, you need the development banks. Those were erased because all the Washington consensus after the, um, the 70s, after the uh, Bretton Woods system was broken, uh, at the end of the 70s, and all the, um, uh, this course that you have during the 80s and 90s were to liberalize the banking system. So that's why many countries have been improved more and you have a lot of inequality, especially on, on their development in the, on their developed countries and also in, in, in USA and in, other, uh, and in the European countries. So I think development banks is the key for development um, economic development and sustainable development also. The second one is that you, the, the G, digital, fin, digital and financial inclusion. There is a lot of papers just uh, coming from the OECD and uh, also from the um, ECLAC, from the Comisión Económica para América Latina, the, even just last week, the secretary for the ECLAC of Latin America, and when she gave the, um, the, ¿cómo se llama? the informe, the, the report of the direct investment, she specified a lot in the digital economy. 
digital is coming, economy is a concept for, uh, that we are going to live with that concept because of course there is a, a big change in technological, there is a, robot, a robotization in all the industrial sectors and it is immersed in, in, in us. It is very difficult to see it, especially for my generation, but for the young generation and the, and, and the millennials, they are in the digital economy. So your question is, and I think it is very important, when you see if digital uh, and financial inclusion will improve uh, a better life. Well, what I have seen in, the, in this high-level panel of United Nations is that it is a very close relations between the big finance corporation, as Citibank, and also Muxila, who was there, the, the, the president of Muxila was in the, in the high-level panel, and also one of the principal CEOs of the Citibank, and also the WIGO, which is another, um, they were very, very important people that are trying to influence a lot in this technolo technological change to have better operations, especially, but especially financial operations. So we are in the digital economy. It, it will be a shame if we close, no? if we are blind to digital uh, economy. But the problem is that for me, it's very difficult to accept that especially digital and financial inclusion will help you to a better life. I don't know if I answer your question, but it is digital economy. We are in the digital economy. Everything is changing very fast. It's a really new change. But at the same time, you just can't see, for example, in little um, places where even you don't have infrastructure of water, you don't have infrastructure of electricity, how you can improve with a cell phone, no, with, a, with the energy of the, the sun energy? Are you going to improve your transactions? Are you going to improve? If you see, and here is uh, Rodolfo Garcia Zamora with those, he is from Zacatecas, and in Zacatecas, there are a lot of um, little places where you don't have the infrastructure for water, you don't have this infrastructure for the schools, you live for, uh, for a lot of uh, flus of uh, uh, capital flus that came from remittance, and you don't have employment. So how can you see, how, how can you explain that these little communities are going to improve with financial and digital inclusion. I think it's a like, a, well, in which world I live, no? So, so well, what are they talking to me? And especially if you relate this digital economy with the stakeholders and the shareholders who are behind the sustainable development goals of the Agenda 2030. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions here? I think there was one there. Okay, thank uh, I'm Rick Moltz. I'm at the John Moulson School of Business. I do mostly studies of uh, developing countries, businesses in developing countries, so your presentations were great because they're much more contextual than the kind of things I do. Um, so it's sort of an integrated question. Um, Yan talked about shadow banking. Alicia talked about how commercial banks are taking over microfinance. And then Johanna used the uh, very, not disagreeing with you, the words uh, capitalist institutions taking over um, the processes you were talking about. So my question is, is this inevitable? Is the commercial banks taking over um, microfinance? Is the capitalist system taking over what Alyssa was talking about? Is it inevitable because of the shadow banking system? I don't know what to say. 
<laughs> okay, let's start going back with, with Roy, who gave us a hint on the relationship between those two questions. Really, it's not the development part of the banks that we're interested in, it's the national part, because your reference to Bretton Woods says basically Bretton Woods wanted to prevent international capital flows. If you don't have international capital flows, then you, by definition, you have national banks, and the national banks are supposed to provide the financing for development. So the question is, should we go back more towards, I, I presume that your question was, wouldn't it be more sensible to go back more towards national financing of development purposes rather than relying on international purposes? And this then raises the question of whether it's possible. And this basically, I think the last uh, question said that would it be inevitable that private markets would eventually take this over and turn it back to the kind of international financial system? Because basically, that's what we get when we allow the markets to finance development. As Jacob Viner told us in 1947, that if you want the global economy to grow, you have to have open international capital markets because this way you efficiently distribute savings according to their most productive, their most productive uses. So the question is, how do you break you know, how do you break into that circular reasoning? Because if, if you accept it, it says, yes, we're going to have international capital flows, yes, we're going to have private financing of development, and, well, everything that comes with it. So this is why we have to go back and say just exactly what, you know, what do banks do when they provide development? And here, Joanna's starting out with Polanyi's initial idea of if you like, social accounts or social accounting, is particularly insightful, I think, because if you look at Schumpeter's never finally published book on money, you find in it a chapter on effectively social accounts. He talks about the social balance sheet and how finance would take place in a socialist economy. And he says, this would be much more efficient than it is in a capitalist economy. Because, why? Because you run the social accounting framework and you can use the social accounting framework in order to do precisely what the financial system is supposed to do. And that is to match debits and credits inside the system, okay? Now, you don't need private banks to do that, he says. You know, the socialist government can do this just fine. It has no difficulty doing it and probably does it much more efficiently than a private market would do that. So that the answer to your question you find either by looking at Polanyi or by looking at, well, if you, as I mentioned before, if you start from Ben Dixon and Schumpeter, the, what they were writing in 1907, 1908, 1909, all of this is saying basically what banks do is to, to provide a social distribution of the national output by means of particular tokens that everybody gets when they contribute. And the problem is how do you match up those tokens, one with the other. Under socialism, you have one way of doing this. Under capitalism, you have a separate way. So again, you know, it's not necessary. It's the fact that we allow them to do it because the private banks to do it. My last point is that if you look at every government that has financed a war, every government that finances a war discovers that number one, the private banking system doesn't want to do it, okay? So what do they do? They say, well, we can do this quite easily. You go back to the 1418 war in England. The Bank of England, okay, financed, okay, the British war effort because Britain didn't have enough gold and the banks were unwilling to lend. The banks looked at what the bank was doing and very quickly said, oh, no, wait a minute. This is not good because you're not charging interest on the money that you're creating. We would like to have that interest. And they eventually convinced the British government and the Bank of England to do the same thing. In the United States, in the Second World War, Wright Patman, a, private, uh, sorry, a congressional representative from Texas, raised the question, we are fighting this war. Why in the world are we borrowing from banks the money that we give to the banks in order to fight the war? Because then we have to pay interest on the money. If we did it directly, we wouldn't have to pay interest. We could simply, we, it's the dollar bills are dollar bills, there's zero interest 
debts of the government, why can't we use those and save us the problem of creating a very large war debt? Okay? Exactly the same thing happened in the United States during the Civil War when the discussion took place over the issue of greenbacks. Okay? Is it impossible for the government to finance the war expenditure? The private bank said, absolutely, you can't do it. And the people who understood the financial system said, well, there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it because these are debts and these are credits and all we have to do is match the debts and credits. This is what Yugoslavia discovered and this is what every socialist government discovers when they run their financial system. Okay, they can do it. Whether you do it internationally or domestically doesn't make any difference. So the response to your question is yes, you can do this without the private market. This is a no, not a problem. The basic problem is to defend yourself against the bankers telling you that no, you cannot fight your war unless you pay me 4% war loan. You say, well, why, can't I, why, why do I have to do that? Well, you have to do that because otherwise the financial system will collapse. You say, well, okay, you know, if we lose the war, the financial system collapses anyway. <laughs> What's the big deal? Okay. Exactly the same thing that you saw in 2008. You have to bail out the banks because if you don't do that, the financial system will collapse. <laughs> but the financial system had already collapsed. <laughs> so the big problem, as I say, going back, it's, it's not so much that you need these things for development. You need to recognize that you can do it on a national basis. You do not need international capital in order to do this. You do not need the international bankers to do this. And I'll come back to Roy, one of the things, I mean, I am not a supporter of the Bretton Woods system at all. Why? Because the Bretton Woods system allowed the international bankers to come in and take it over. Effectively, they defended their interests and what you got out of Bretton Woods was a system in which you were required to finance internationally through the system. As you quite right point out, rightly point out, the original idea from Secretary of the Treasury Morgenthau to John Maynard Keynes, Morgenthau said, we want to throw the international bankers out of the temple of international finance. When you got up to the hotel at Bretton Woods, what happened? The guys in New York were on the phone and they said, look, if you do this, we're never going to finance the U.S. government again. And what did the U.S. government do? He said, oh, okay, fine. We're going to allow you to take this over. And this is effectively what happened. So the part of the Bretton Woods system that you want was the part that said, if there's international finance, the World Bank is going to do it. Because that was the original idea. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development was supposed to do the distribution of international financing. Well, that disappeared very, very quickly. Okay, there's just one last question I'm going to allow for right now, to, uh, and uh, hopefully it'll be short. Uh, I would, uh, uh, could, could you go up on the, yeah, okay. From the perspective you've been presenting, fictitious commodities, financialization, socialist accounting, and now development, how should we address the initiatives put forward by China, the Silk Road, the, the Infrastructure Development Bank, they are mobilizing financial resources in order to mobilize physical resources. I wouldn't dare to say that that's fictitious. It's pretty real. But how should we uh, address the question uh, presented by China in the last uh, 10 years? First, Go ahead. Okay. In the U.S. we have these publicity campaigns and one of the publicity campaigns that was set up by a number of Republican governments was just say no to drugs. Now I would rephrase that, just say no to international financial transfers because the Chinese are in fact no different from any other international lender, okay? For two reasons. The first reason is that if you look at the kinds of international investments that the Chinese make, they, if they don't disturb, at least they undermine efforts to domestic industrialization, which I still think is a very important part 
of the development process. Primarily, these are investments in terms of primary commodity supplies to China first. Secondly, they do create the ability of China to solve its domestic problems by means of international investments. Okay? If we take the infrastructure bank, okay? Chinese policymakers always take a long-term view on things. They know that eventually the market in the United States is not going to be as supportive and as large as it has been in giving demand to employment in China. So the question is, how do you replace the US? Well, if you look to the other direction, okay, you can look east or you can look west. Okay? The east is red, the west is now becoming red. Okay? One road, one belt is what? Is a way to change direction and find markets for Chinese goods in the other direction. And this is precisely what this is meant to do. Secondly, if you have large excess capacity in steel building and you have large excess capacity in a number of other areas and you have to find demand for that capacity, how do you do it? Effectively, you've done what has always been done is you lend to foreigners in order to allow them to buy your exports, okay? The United States did this in Latin America for years. China is now doing exactly the same thing. So I would say you have to look at this in a longer term context. Is China really providing for you the change in the domestic structure of production, which is going to allow you to become a more domestically demand driven economy, or are you going to become more dependent on external investment, external flows, and to build up large scale international indebtedness, which eventually will have to be met by doing what? Well, there's only one way you repay, and that's either you get your donors to forgive the loans, or you have to create an external surplus to pay it back. And the only way we know to create an external surplus is by reducing employment, reducing demand, and creating a domestic depression. Okay, unfortunately, this idea that somehow or other you can export your way into an export surplus in an international context has never yet been seen, and I doubt very seriously if it will ever arrive. In particular, when you have a president of the United States who believes that the United States, which used to be the deficit country of last resort, believes it is now going to become the surplus country <laughs> of first resort which means that anybody who borrows from China is never going to be able to pay off. Uh, I'm not sure if Alicia or uh, Joanna you want to say anything. Yeah. <laughs> if well, people do, please be quick. <laughs> very, <laughs> very quick. Um, I think the Chinese financial system has one problem. It is not in the banking, in the commercial banking sector, it's in the shadow financial uh, system. But the financial system, the problem that they have, it is very related to the, uh, the um, 1.8 trillion that, they put, that the Popular Bank of China puts inside of the economy after the Lehman Brothers, uh, uh, Lehman's brother crisis. So the, this obor, I think it is, very, it is very important to see how they are going to Central Asia and to Africa because they're uh, behind the, these investments that they are doing there, it's also the minerals that they need for the, this new economy. And it is, uh, if it is very, it's uh, most of the, um, of the investment that they are doing are in Asia, then in Africa, and very less in Latin America. Even they have uh, bought many, for example, they have uh, bought some com uh, Latin American companies, but even though one of the things that it is, and I am great with Jan Creole, for example, they have just uh, put in Djibouti uh, military base. They are um, in Pakistan. They are also very interested in one of the port that it will take all their products to, uh, to Africa. So it is very interesting to see what's going in in China. Uh, and the question is, if there's going to be, if, if the next financial crisis is going to be in China, I think yes, and I, at the same time, I think it's not 
I, maybe no, because they have a very big government, and that's when you ask that these uh, the academies of the um, China, how to say the Social Chinese Academy, they will say no, we won't have a uh, financial crisis because we have a big government. Let me first say what a great honor it is for me to be part of this celebration of our dear friend and colleague, Carrie Polanyi Levitt. In recognition of the awarding of the Iphigenia Martinez Prize by the Faculty of Economics at UNAM in Mexico, and to do so in the company of good friends and colleagues from Mexico, from the United States, and of course from Canada. Um, I must say that the discussion is very timely because as we are talking here, uh, the three NAFTA amigos, or should I say former amigos, <laughs> are sitting down in Washington DC to renegotiate NAFTA and that's going to be the subject of one of our presentations, so it's very timely. I believe we are at a time of great transition. And I'd ask, as we go into this panel, does the present conjuncture portend the end of neoliberalism as we've known it for the past three decades? And if so, will it be succeeded by an era of greater equality and stability? Or, on the other hand, will other forces prevail, the forces of reactionary populism, and I'll say it, fascism, that erupted in the streets of Charlottesville over the weekend. So we live in a fraught time, but I believe our panelists are well equipped to tackle some of these issues, and my job is simply to help them to do it within 20 minutes. Um, so I will brandish um, a five minute note uh, sign that uh, will warn them that their time is uh, going to end in five minutes. So let me just start by introducing Carrie Polanyi Levitt. I've had the pleasure of knowing Carrie over the past 30 years. And I'd like to say a couple of things, because I'm sure she's also going to be introduced later on this evening. But Carrie, as we know, had a very inspiring parent uh, in the shape and form of her father, Carl Polanyi, whose legacy Carrie has worked very hard to build over the past three decades. Perhaps less well known is that she was also inspired by her mother, Ilona Duchinska, who is a distinguished journalist, engineer, historian, and revolutionary. So these were formative influences on Carrie as she was growing up. Also, I thought it might be interesting because some people might not know that uh, Carrie's very ver varied career over the decades has included among other things, being a technical economist. She's worked on input-output tables, she's worked on economic statistics, she's worked on national income accounts. These are very much part of um, Carrie's career track. But perhaps she's best uh, known for her work on development in the Caribbean and on aspects of Canada's economic policies. And I'm thinking here of her famous book, which was republished, uh, a little while ago now on uh, silent surrender, uh, multinationals uh, and the takeover of uh, Canada. In Canada, she's been recognized for her contributions to the establishment of international development studies as an interdisciplinary field for which she was 
awarded the Order of Canada in the year 2014. So, Carrie, congratulations for this latest distinction from our Mexican friends, and please speak to us on Carl Polanyi for the 21st century. Carrie. I find it hard to find sufficient, th to find the words with which to express my thanks to our Mexican, to my Mexican colleagues for the appreciation of my work to the degree that they undertook the translation of the whole damn book of collection collected essays published in 2013. Um, you must believe me when I say that what they have done in order to make this available to a Spanish reading audience and what lies behind that which is the appreciation of what is written in that book as being important. I think has added a few life to few years to my already very long life. I feel encouraged to continue uh, as I have in the past to do my best to to participate in the discussion of what is development in the era of globalization. Um, I think this collection of essays, the book called From the Great Transformation to the Great Financialization, has attempted to introduce Karl Polanyi's ideas into the development discourse, into the, deve into the uh, discussion of various aspects of development, some of which were discussed this morning. Um, I have to tell you that my interest in issues of what was then called underdevelopment, development, underdevelopment, all of these issues that emerged after the Second World War and with the decolonization of Asia and Africa, these interests long preceded my appreciation of the importance of the work of my father. I know that many people would imagine that I imbibed wisdoms from my father from the time as we sat around the dinner table in, in my childhood or youth. But not only did we rarely sit around the dinner table, uh, either in Vienna or in England or anywhere else, um, but like many others here, I learned to appreciate the insights of Karl Polanyi as a political economist, as, a, as an economist, as a professional, if you wish. Because when I was teaching McGill Development Economics, I think I rarely mentioned the name of Karl Polanyi. And it was not because uh, of any foolish reasons of wishing not to mention him because he happens to be my family. It was because I did not appreciate the importance of his ideas, as I have learned to do since. Um, when I shared my enthusiasm for development issues in the 1950s with my father, he was frankly quite skeptical. Uh, he was always encouraging to, for anything that I may, might wish to do. But, you know, he would say in his own way, he said, you know, development, Kari, I, I don't know what that means. That was his way of saying, look, I'm rather suspicious of this. I don't like Rostow. He had a particular, he detested Rostow and his stages of growth and his non, non what is it, non-communist manifesto and uh, what was then the, um, the current literature going around of American origin. 
And I think it was his fear that the countries that had gained their independ political independence in Asia and Africa uh, would um, follow, so to speak, the uh, American uh, style of capitalist uh, path. It is what he wished not to see. However, in 1957, uh, and uh, in the knowledge of his mortality and his cancer diagnosis, uh, he wrote to a friend of his childhood, quote, all my, my work is for the new nations of Africa and Asia. So he wished his work uh, to, to enter into the discussion, the, the, so to speak, the development discourse. He did not mention the non-aligned movement, but 1957 certainly was a time in which uh, that movement was um, very prominent. So I see the importance of what my Mexican colleagues have done in translating this, this um, book um, as a step toward introducing the thoughts and the ideas and the insights of Karl Polanyi into the development uh, discourse. Um, he, he, he was um, not particularly interested in Latin America or the Caribbean. Um, I suppose he did not think of this part of the world as being, being uh, those regions liberated from <coughs> the European political colonialism in the 1950s. Now, because the title I have given to this little talk is the myth of a what? Of a global market economy and the decline of the West and the rise of the rest. Let me attempt to explain. I think the neoliberal um, agenda and the neoliberal discourse was very clever in understanding the importance of language. And the language which introduced the word global into the discourse and replace, replacing international interdependence, of course, it's, a much ne it's much neater. But when global replaces international interdependence, international cooperation, in the international in any sense of the word, what is done, it is to, it, it eliminates the nation. It eliminates it in the way in which global capital wishes uh, to be freed from what I think it is streak has called, appropriately called, the national cage. Capital is escaping the national cage, meaning it is escaping national regulation, it is escaping politics, because politics, as far as the as far as, as far as, in fact, we are re in reality concerned with it, operates at the national level, it does not operate at any supranational level. That is a myth, the fiction. And I think there that Danny Roderick has explained this more clearly with his famous trilemma of the um, incompatibility of globalization, of strong globalization with national sovereignty or democracy. I have, uh, I, I would like to, sh I would like to suggest that this, this is not a coherent lecture you're going to hear. This is more of an effort to outline in, in, in 15 minutes uh, so the research agenda and to leave some ideas to be explored, leave some ideas with you. I, I have an uncomfortable feeling that the neoliberal discourse 
has appropriated the internationalism of the socialist movements of years gone by, and by substituting global for international and removing the, what is that? Oh, sorry, I thought it was a sign about how many more minutes I have. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I couldn't read the number on it. I thought you were telling me I'm running out of time. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's your duty. Okay. Well, what I'm saying is, you see that this, the, the word global, the global information technology, the digital world we move into, is attractive to young people. Um, and that's nothing the matter with that. But I think what we are losing, and in, if, it, if it is not deliberate, uh, then it has the same effect of eliminating the concept of the nation. Uh, or if it is not eliminated, then it is to be associated with everything that is backward, conservative, reactionary, or even fascist, or populist, or whatever. Whereas, in fact, we continue our lives, and most of it, we live, we do not live in a global economy. We live, we do live, in a way, in a national economy, because at the level of our country, whatever country we live in, uh, there, uh, there are governments, there are laws, there are institutions, um, social, economic, and otherwise, which provide the framework within which the economy and the society functions. Um, there is no such political framework at the global level. The idea that there could be, well, perhaps, but it is nothing that is uh, in any foreseeable way uh, can be foreseen. Um, and, the sub and the discourse of international solidarity has been replaced, I think, by the liberal discourse. No, I say liberal um, deliberately of universal human rights, which are individual. These do not have anything to do with states. These are in the, in the individual, yes. And it is part of, of our tradition. But it is no substitute. It is neither a substitute for solidarities that exist and are built within countries and nations or between peoples and nations. Um, and I fear that what has, what has happened is that the left, the liberal left, including the social democratic parties of Europe, Democrats in the United States, have um, abrogated responsibility to mobilize opposition uh, to the concentration of capital. Um, by adopting, in effect, so much of the market-oriented uh, philosophy. Uh, and they have uh, they have uh, given to the political right uh, the position of the defense of those classes and sectors and peoples who have been disadvantaged by globalization. That is now very clear and has been said by many people. There's nothing original about saying it, but it is nevertheless true uh, that what we call what is what is called populist um, opposition, anyway, the area, uh, represents the, um, the loss, the sense of loss and the very real loss 
um, of large sections of the population in all the countries of the advanced capitalist world, it is a loss uh, to the advance of globalization. You see, because the, the impact of globalization on societies um, come from the outside. The, the, the great um, structures of multinational corporations um, are power structures, economic power structures, which do not have to abide by any rules that are cr or, or regulations by na national governments. In fact, the opposite occurs, as I suggested. They influence quite strongly the um, actions and policies of national governments. So what does Polanyi offer? I think he offers the most effective answer to the famous statement by Margaret Thatcher, there is no such thing as society. I think that his um, insights are pre valid precisely because it, he insists on the fact that society does exist and society is an agent, and within society, there, there are the, um, the, the counter-movements of which he speaks uh, come as movements within society to protect against the um, disintegrating forces of monetary, financial, market transactions, of uh, winners and losers, and of course, where the strong are always the winners. Yeah, what? How many more minutes? Oh, no. I'm so sorry, I'm okay. We'll, we'll switch to the next topic. <laughs> oh no, this is awful. The, um, when I say the decline of the West and the rise of the rest, um, I, I, it is amazing to me how few people did, discussing development are conscious of the fact that a mere 200 years ago, it's not very long ago, 200 years ago, 1820, uh, China's production at purchasing power valuation, which is the only one which we can compare across countries, was equal to that of all of Western Europe and Eastern Europe and all of the Russian Empire put together at about 33%. Of world, of world output. So when China is now returning to the, to the world economy, it is now returning to Eurasia, um, the, it is, I think, only the beginning of the return of uh, China. Um, I am now intimidated by the fact I have now only four more minutes. <laughs> But um, I wanted to share with you and to point to you that I think the reading for this part of the lecture um, is Deepak Nayar's wider lecture, but particularly his book called Catch Up, which is really what de economic development in many ways is really about, and the amazing uh, um, rate at which particularly Asia, developing Asia, uh, is uh, catch, catching up. And uh, not only in the fact, in the manufacturing sectors, which are now um, much more important than the export of primary or, or processed primary products, but in moving toward the high end, technologically high end of that sector. Um, I wanted to talk about the Bennington lectures, the five lectures that my father gave in Bennington in late 1940 before setting out to write the book. I would like you to, all of you, please, it is worth reading these. You can find them on a website called Prime Economics. Um, it's a site established by Anne Pettifer and her associates of post-Keynesians. 
Um, and in that, I can remember one sentence verbatim and I've quoted to you. And he said, modern nationalism, meaning the nationalism of the 1930s, is a defensive reaction to the problems inherent in an interdependent world. And this was his explanation uh, of the reactions in Europe where the conflict, and I think ultimately the conflict between capitalism and socialism, or certainly the conflict between big business and parliamentary majorities of socialist parties, um, led the capitalists to prefer um, Hitler and other similar uh, rulers to democracy. They were ready to sacrifice democracy in order to save, if you wish, uh, capitalism. And um, the reason why Polanyi has returned, I think, to such prominence are precisely in, ter in terms of the explanation of the, um, uh, the, the politics uh, which um, of, of popular of populist opposition. I wanted to finish the talk. I suppose I'm over my five, three minutes. <laughs> with with the, the very interesting idea um, that we are living in a period of interregnum. The, the phrase comes from Gramsci. It was picked up by, um, by ba um, Bauman. Sigmund Bauman, uh, who wrote so beautifully about the uh, liquid society, about the dissolution of solidarities uh, in terms of uh, identity politics that uh, destroyed a lot of solidarities in our economies uh, in the advanced countries. And it is used also by um, Wolfgang Strick, who, in my opinion, remains, if, if there is one single, person who comments on what is happening currently, I think his are the most insightful and uh, readable uh, comments. Uh, the idea being, of course, that an old order is uh, disappearing, collapsing, dying. Uh, it is that neoliberal order that is, a, um, in a way, a reconstruction in a different form of the 19th century liberal economic order that uh, collapsed in the 1930s. But I think it is best understood as a deliberate dissolution of the assist of the uh, compromise of capital and labor that was instituted in those 30 so-called golden years. Uh, neoliberalism is well understood as the, the destruction and dissolution of all those measures that were taken at that time. But I have finally one thought, one other thought to leave with you, and I told you this is um, an agenda of ideas and of directions in which to look. And that has to do with, with the problem it was raised this morning of the technology, the digital technology, the information technology. I think we have so far failed to look this thing, to look at what is coming here. Uh, we, we have a climate crisis, ecological. We have a financial crisis. We are told by many experts that is coming. But perhaps these are small compared with what is coming at the rate with which digital technology and artificial intelligence is replacing work. It is replacing labor. It is, um, as was feared 30 years ago by Vasily Leontiev, who, speaking about technology, which was his subject, of expertise, uh, described the possibility of a society in which 20% of people 
um, with the information technology. And he's writing in the mid-80s, uh, able to produce everything that needs to be produced. And the other 80% uh, put out to graze like the horses that were no longer required after the Industrial Revolution uh, to pull the uh, plows or to uh, pull uh, the wagons. He said it would take a cultural revolution in order to adjust to that kind of a society. Well, I believe it is approaching rather rapidly. And some people might think anything that uh, lightens work that reduces uh, work is always a benefit. Uh, that is not necessarily the case. The fact is that work and participation in, in, in the society and, and work in itself is also something which is normal and natural for us to wish to do. Um, I think, finally, let me suggest to you that we know the most important thing in our modern society is no longer anything material because most basic material requirements by and large are being met. The most, the most, desired, the most desired thing in our modern society is a good job. It is, is employment of the kind uh, that, uh, that uh, is well remunerated, that has conditions, that is unionized, uh, that is, in a, a, is the kind of work that is disappearing. Um, and economic growth has become a social necessity of a kind uh, in order to produce even that minimum of growth that will somehow assist in the entry of younger people into the labor force. Uh, and so long as somebody can find something sufficiently profitable to balance the risks involved in investing in it, and so long as we can be persuaded to buy whatever it is of goods or services that are produced, the system can go on. But but these conditions, given the inequality of income, given the loss of purchasing power, given the decline of the middle class, given the rate at which technology is destroying employment, uh, that is not, not a solution. And I think those of us who think about socialism, one has to think of a different set of values and a different way of regarding the relationship to society, the economy, we have to go back to some real basics because the fact that artificial intelligence can eliminate a great amount of work um, is, does not make it easier but makes it more difficult. Uh, the challenges are, I think, to think of how, of how we can rid ourselves of the, this ru of the rule of the calculation that more is always better, uh, that um, sufficiency is uh, not anything interesting, and a whole lot of other things. And I finally have come to the conclusion, if I, ne if I need one uh, slogan to sum up what I believe, I would say, to all those who are fascinated by the digital technology, a simpler life is an easier life, a better life. A simpler life is a better life. We wish to be more simply and directly connected with nature and with people. Uh, yes, we have to live with the artificiality of the digital uh, revolution, of the fact that we almost lose the capacity to do anything with our hands other than work on a keyboard. Uh, these are huge problems, and I'm, I want to thank you for an opportunity to air and share some of my concerns with you. Thank you. Eugenia Correa is Professor of Finance, Development, and Feminist Economics of the Faculty of Economics of UNAM in Mexico. 
She belongs to a number of distinguished associations, among them including the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's won a number of awards. She has over 140 publications in scholarly journals uh, and uh, in the form of books. Um, Professor Correa will speak to us about abandoning neoliberal policies under austerity, South American lessons of development economics. Thank you, thank you uh, for all of us, for all of you to be here today. I'm really very happy to chair this uh, afternoon with you all, but especially with uh, Kari Polanyi. I'm very proud to be here because she's here, she's here with us. And of course, my teacher, my teacher Ifigenia Martinez, which I really admire deeply and and of course, uh, my admiration for these two women that even they con even his age, they continue to and uh, with uh, this struggle of uh, and especially to to believe in the in a better life for all of us. Um, I want to start. I don't want to. I want to start this. Uh, this 10 minutes of paper saying that precisely in, 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 in February of the next year, we will uh, have the 170 years of the, of the sign of the treaty, Guadalupe Hidalgo, in which Mexico lose the more than a half of the territory after the war of with United States, the in one in in just 170 years ago, and it was signed that treaties by precisely the president Manuel Peña y Peña. <laughs> is, this, is this not a coincidence, or maybe yes, or maybe not? But I want to start with this first. Um, well, I take just. Uh, a few minutes more just for a, make an, a really uh, short presentation of my paper. Because uh, um, I was, uh, I have uh, several years uh, studied what is happening with the different process in Latin American countries, especially in the South countries, and the, the break that they, that they did it with the neoliberalist policies. And they started with a new, with an, just with a new project of economy and society. And, and right now it is very important to have this uh, uh, insight uh, and uh, analysis because it is, uh, we, are, we will have a, a, an election, presidential election next year in Mexico. And we really need to, to take the lessons of the South American countries. Well, well, here is the questions that I try to put in my paper. And uh, of course, we need to learn what is happening, what happened with those countries, uh, not only politically, but also economically. What, is, what happened, uh, uh, if it is just a political pendulum, or we, have, or we can take some uh, important lessons for policymakers in the next future, especially for Mexico but we need to look a little, a little deeply this experience. Oops. I take this, these countries, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Venezuela. I discuss in the paper why I take these countries and don't take another countries, let's say Chile, for example, that someone can ask to me that Well, all, o all over these um, this, uh, movements uh, against the neoliberalism, let's try to, to restart uh, a little or strong sovereignty over the territory, over the economics, over the politics, over every single, and the, main, the major actors of these uh, countries really, really need this uh, restarting this, 
a, a sovereignty project in economics for their countries. It was not only a popular demand, but it was also a demand of the elites, of some part of the elites of, the, of those countries. Well, I, I include in my presentation uh, some uh, indicators, but maybe I need to just to give <laughs> just just take the the conclusion of the all the analysis that I did it with the statistics that I have. And these uh, left governments uh, that really uh, try to reestablish sovereignty over the res natural resource, over the territory, etc., cetera, uh, make some advances and make some uh, really uh, cl clear excuse that in these uh, projects. First of one, the advances, of course, was the stabilization because most of those economies and countries uh, came from a huge story of unstable governments and economy. Then they, they uh, restart uh, growth, which is, was very important in a different degree, of course. More, it was m more important for Bolivia or Ecuador than for uh, uh, Brazil, for example. You know, they restart the control of the corruption that was uh, very important. Maybe you now say Brazil, we have a lot of a lot of example of good, uh, good examples of corruption, but the corruption that they confront is, uh, when they start in this uh, process was uh, more deeply and really uh, inside all the population, and they restart the control of the corruption. This, uh, of course, tried to go deeper in democracy, and really they have, some of these countries have this, uh, constitutional constitutional uh, assemb assembly which give a new constitution and new organization of the states and even uh, new institutions that create uh, some uh, deeply opportunities of, for more democracy, especially for some local movements, indigenous movements, and also for, for the elites. Well, they have also uh, some kind of uh, limits that they couldn't stop. They, well, they, all of them achieve uh, better income distribution, which was very important. Uh, uh, reduce the poverty, which is also very important. But at the same time, they couldn't manage them. The, pro the economic project, and they really make more stronger the project in, as, a, as a, a commodity exportation, primary commodity exportations. Also, in the main point, it was that they couldn't move outside the austerity policies, especially monetary and fiscal policies, which really reduced uh, a lot his opportunity to, uh, con to construct a uh, sovereignty project. Some of them uh, go very, very, very deeply in the renegotiation of the debt, foreign debt, which was very important, especially for Argentina and for uh, Ecuador, which liberate part of the in of part of the income of the states in order to uh, produce better results in social policies. But they, for example, don't have really uh, very important advances in, in salaries, which the salaries really grow very slowly if it, if it, did, if it did it. Well, the point here is that the interest of the foreign uh, corporation, especially the large uh, financial corporation, uh, continue growth in, in, Latin, in South America, even with these uh, neoliberal, non-neoliberal governments or left government, especially, for example, in farmland in Argentina and, of course, uh, Brazil and other countries. 
And we have also the example of in mining, but I have only the, the, for these statistics just the farmer land. Maybe you cannot see this. Ah, no. Well, it is just the uh, prices of the farmland in Latin America, which was uh, the most important growth in the last years, especially after the financial crisis of 2007. Those prices, those prices even grow better, um, higher than, the, than other uh, commodities like uh, oil or, or food. And it shows really the, the speculation, the advance of the speculation in, the, in our territories in South America, even with, uh, with, um, with non-neoliberal governments. Well, I, I, how many minutes have I? Um, five. Five. Just thank you for remembering. And then I, I, I just uh, f find these uh, words of the in OCD report, and I think that it is very important that they say that there are uh, this uh, a strong private interest in the reforms, in the economic reforms that has uh, that has that had made it in the in all these in in all these countries, also the not only the north, also the south, uh, but especially all the OCD countries. Well, I want to, in the last two minutes, to emphasize two things. First, I want the lesson for policymakers that I tried to arrive in my paper after those, all these um, short, uh, short analyzing statistics, etc. First, I want there are no possible to have a non-neoliberal non left-wing government with austerity policies. Maybe that it is uh, very obvious for many of the nation here, but it is not obvious for many polit politician, uh, Mexican politicians that really uh, need to know, even the left one, that really need to understand that it is not possibilities to have a project, an economic development project in, in Mexico or in other Latin American countries with austerity policies. Second one, that institutional changes are very important for really to have a, uh, an, um, an economic and politic uh, project, no uh, neoliberal project. And third one, that it, it is demonstrated by the, by the South American countries that foreign debt renegotiation are, and, especially, and capital controls are very important in order to try really to manage the external constraints of all our economy. The second idea, the second uh, thing, part of that I want to, to underline in my presentation is precisely that uh, we have the honor to have uh, the Caribolangi book at, uh, in, in our journal, Ola Financiera, uh, several chapters, and right now, all the book in, the, in Ola Financiera for all the students in Spanish, for all the students, Mexican and Latin American uh, students, and we are really very happy to, to have this, uh, this opportunity and I can say right now that uh, several students in the last semesters of our faculty have uh, a new discover, discovered the work with this book, uh, reading this book in our journal, Ola Financiera. Well, that's it, thank you very much. Rodolfo Garcia Zamora is Director of Development Studies at the Autonomous University of Zacatecas in Mexico. Um, he's also a member of several distinguished bodies, including the Mexican Academy of Political Science and the Euro-Latin American 
Development Studies Network, Celso Furtado. Um, previously, he was professor at the Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Mexico and at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. He too has extensive publications, over 100 articles and books. Professor Zamora will uh, speak about the uh, NAFTA and the future of Mexico, agrarian crisis, employment, and international migration. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be in this conference with the presence of Professor Kari Polanyi and Eugenia Martinez. Thanks to Eugenia, Mario, and Polanyi Institute by invitation. The team that I want the, to present to you is NAPTA, International Migration and the Future of Mexico. The central thesis that I want to share you are next. In 1982, the neoliberal model dismantled rural development policies, concerning a crisis in the countryside, unemployment and migration. Second, NAFTA deepens the crisis in rural abandonment. Migration to U.S. reaches new highs through 2007 is an escape bubble for the neoliberal model. Third, at 2016-2017, Trump economic and political war against Mexico risks depending neoliberal impacts on employment, poverty, and more violence. Fifth, challenger to Mexico, a political change and reorientation of economic model toward employment, income, a stronger internal market, and human security. The original objectives of NAPTA were next. First, remove obstacles to free trade of goods and services among the three partner countries. Second, promote fair competition within the trade zone. Third, foster investment opportunities. Fourth, protect intellectual property rights. Fifth, create efficient procedures to fulfill the pact and to resolve conflicts. And six, established mechanisms for new forms of existing cooperation effort to increase benefits. In the case of critical economics like Arturo Huerta, Jose Luis Calva, Oropesa, and others, the main negative future impact of NAPTA will be next. Inequal and surviving negotiation. Second, destruction of the internal and rural market. Third, loss of food sovereignty and massive rural exodus. Fourth, loss of control over the national economy. Fifth, the agreement makes neoliberalism irreversible. It's important to remember the opinion of Carlos Salinas de Gortari in November 1993. Under NAFTA, crisis will disappear forever. It's important after 23 years of NAFTA the importance of China in the trade with the United States. This is the reason why I put in the top side the full partner in NAFTA. In the figure one, we can see how China boost trade grew eight times with the US from 1991 to 2007. US trade deficit grow without a free trade agreement with China. In the, in the case of U.S. exportation in 2015, we're about 1.5 trillion American dollar, with Canada with 18.6 percent, Mexico 15.6 percent, China 7.2 percent, and Japan 4.2 percent. In the case of importation from U.S. 2015, we're about 2.3 trillion American dollar, China Aport 48.2, Germany 9.9%, Japan 8.9%, Mexico 8.9%, Canada 2.8%, a negative balance of 763 billion American dollar. 
Key Mexican Trading Partner. In the case of Mexico, exportation 2016 were about 719 billion American dollar, with US 80%, Canada 2.8%, China 1.4%, Germany 1.1%. In the case of Mexican importation in the same year, 2016, were about 387 billion American dollar, with US 46.4%, with China 18%, with Japan 4.6%, and Canada 2.5%. Mexico trade surplus with US was about 86 billion American dollar. But for other part, the deficit with China, Japan, Korea, and Malaysia since 1993. And one of the explaining of this situation is that Mexico worked like a link in the global assembly and maquila manufacturing chain. NAFTA and agriculture, chronicle of disaster for all told. Jose Luis Calva said in 1992, about the asymmetries in public policy, subsidies, and natural resources between especially Mexico and US. The difference in economic, technical, and social regression in the case of Mexico. The real profit for the United States and Canada. Low growth in per capita income for Mexico. The gap between the partner growth. In the figure number three, we see how the employment growth from 1.2 million in 1998 to 2.5 million in 2014. Real income in Mexico in 2017 is lower than before the NAFTA. Agriculture falling share of national GDP. In 2015, Mexican agriculture fell to 3.1 of GDP. A small real increase in agriculture in the GDP, but a smaller share of the pie. This is a reflection of economic, trade, credit, technical, natural, and institution asymmetries. In the North, protection, subsidies, and support. In the case of Mexico, open market, deregulation, and privatization, poverty, and national and international migration. NAFTA, employment and migration. The official narrative about the NAFTA is the represent the lever of economic modernization, employment, and reduced migration. Carlos Salinas de Gotari, again in November 1993, and U.S. visit called for the signing of NAFTA to prevent an invasion of hungry orders from Mexico. And maybe Salinas thought they are dangerous. I know them very well. In 1990, and there were 4.4 million Mexicans in U.S. Calva said about this process, Mexico needs 9% economic growth over 26 years with full employment by 2014. But in that year, unemployment reached 2.5 million. By 2014, informal workers make up 56.5% of national economic active population. The relationship between migration and economic crisis. Large-scale migration of 100 years in between Mexico and U.S. is product of a structural factor in both countries, geography, history, transnational network. But in the last 40 years, crisis and migration are very linked. 1976, 1982, 1944. Prices, neoliberalism, and migration is a shock absorber an escape valve for the neoliberal consequences of insufficient growth and job creation. NAFTA from 1994 to 2014 produced 10 million of peasants leave the rural areas in Mexico, producing big migration to big cities in US. At 70s were 800,000 Mexican in US. In 1990 were 4.4 million Mexican in that country. In 1994 were 6.5 million, a 2009.3 million, a 2010, 11.8 million. And this year, we have in US 12.2 million. And in this big amount, 5.9 million undocumented migrants. Proportional migration of Mexican and US 
undocumented Mexican in that country in 19 were one million, in 1994, two point million, in 2004, point six million, in 2005, point million. Between 2000 and 2007, largest increase from 4.6 to 7 million, historic peak. Last five years, reduction in the number of Mexican migrants in due to anti-immigrant policies, the 2000 and 2012 economic crisis in US, border militarization, violence, higher cost, and deportation. From 2007 and 2017, three million of Mexico were deported from US. Deportation risk now of 5.9 million undocumented migrants. Besides, deportation risk of 1.1 million dreamers if Trump finish DACA agreement in next week. The Mexican nation within the United States. There are diverse transnational communities, 36 million of Mexican origin in US, 12.2 Mexican immigrants born in Mexico, 13 million US citizens with at least one parent born in Mexico, 11.8 million US native who identify as Mexican. International remittances, in 2016 from US to Mexico were about $26.9 billion. Remittances from 1988 to 2017 were about $384 billion. They represented 35% of Mexico GDP. This year, there are 1.3 me uh, million Mexican families that live of remittances from US. In this same year, 2017, Mexico will receive $28 billion of remittances of US. Neoliberalism and NAFTA, Mexico pours a migrant factory. Now we are suffering in Mexico the debt economy with 56% of economic active population and informality, 55.3% of 121 million in poverty. In 2010-2014, the poor grew by 2.5 million. Rural poverty is about 61.1%, and extreme poverty are 20.6%. 5.7 million poor campesinos, indigenous peasants, are the more fragile social network in Mexico. The more critical situation are 160,000 murder and 33,000 missed in Mexico from 2000 to 2070. This is the reason why myself and other colleagues of Zacatecas University speak the neoliberalism in Mexico is the debt economy, debt the, the work, debt the market, debt the life, debt of the future, debt of the hope of the young people. So it is necessary a new national project in the face of neoliberal failure in Trump. In 2016, neoliberal failure in Mexico was very clear. The fall of oil price, 26% devaluation, 9.8 billion pesos of debt that represented 50% of GDP, half a billion pesos in interest payment in 2017. 239 billion pesos cut from rural education, science, technology, and cultural budget. 1.2 billion pesos in interest payment on the 2012-2016 debt. A new national project. In 2017, Mexico way to have a economy grow about 1.8%. Less trade, less foreign direct investment, more deportation, unemployment, and growing of violence through all Mexico. In this process, impaired reorientation of economic model is necessary a war economy. It's necessary to produce 1.5 million jobs annually, increase the urgency to provide more jobs on face national chaos. A strengthening of international ma internal market, producing jobs, more income, well-being, and human security, policy of national food sovereignty, fewer importation, more jobs, and a stronger internal market. Urgency, reorientation, economic, model toward economic growth, employment, income, and well-being. 
but the big challenge is it there is necessary a political change. This is the challenge in Mexico today, and especially next year with presidential election. There will be a very special and complex process. Thank you very much. You mentioned at the end, you, just, you talked a lot about all the dangers uh, of the destruction of work, basically, through robotization, and et cetera, et cetera. But you know, you yourself have been a, an important statistician and worked on issues pertaining to input, output, and all that. And if you look at how the tendencies in terms of productivity growth in the economy over the last 30 years, they give a slightly different picture, <laughs> okay? uh, in the sense that what we see is much lower productivity growth, not higher. Even in the industrial, you know, I mean, you could say, well, maybe in the services sector, we can't pick, pick it up very well. But in those activities where you talk about artificial intelligence, like in the case of robots used in an automobile production is a good example, and I know it exists, I know it's important. But when you look at the actual data on that, it doesn't suggest that we're having this growing acceleration of productivity growth, which you would presume would be the case here. Now, so either it is because we're just not picking it up, or there's something fishy about the whole you know, discourse here that you know, this growing robotization is gonna ultimately lead to this new kind of society where only the, the elite will have jobs in the future. I'm not quite, I'm not sure if I totally understood the question. I think the whole business of the measurement of productivity, when the majority of um, activity uh, uh, services, including 20% uh, of GDP or so, roughly 20%, which are um, uh, basically financial services, finance, insurance, and real estate, and 20% of your GDP. Uh, and in the service sectors, uh, the great difficulty, really, of knowing what the hell we mean by productivity as it is measured. Um, so uh, that would be my, um, my response to what appears to be um, a contradiction. Well, in manufacturing, we have a, a very interesting phenomenon that what some people have called the techno-scientific capitalism, that is the companies uh, that are, at the, they are Silicon Valley companies, the, the Googles and et cetera, produce very little employment uh, for the value of the companies, but they do, and they also produce remarkably little fixed investment. So uh, it, it is, um, when you look at it from a real point of view, of uh, low rates of expenditure on actual uh, gross fixed investment, uh, capital investment, uh, low uh, employment created, but they have a very high monetary value. Uh, I wonder whether that goes to, isn't part of the picture. Now, when you have these studies by, um, by Gordon, what's his name? The, the, pardon? Robert Gordon. Yes, Robert Gordon, thank you. Robert Gordon, which, which, which seemed to show um, declining productivity in, in a, and not only that, but that the, um, the technology of the um, information revolution is different from that of the second or third industrial revolution, which actually produced many very useful products that were genuinely labor saving, obvious example of being all the domestic washing machines and uh, etc. Uh, the, the, the digital revolution has not produced, has, has not lightened our labor, it has displaced us <laughs> from a place in society in, in the workplace. So uh, I maintain that there are very, very 
real differences and of course the obvious fact that the digital revolution uh, produces an exponentially uh, increasing <laughs> strength of its own self because the, 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 the more it enables, the faster it enables data to be processed, uh, the faster it, 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 uh, it enables its own growth. Uh, and and I, I, I continue to think that it presents a huge problem. It ultimately pre presents a problem of what kind of society we want to live in and what are the values we wish to live by. Uh, because as um, my father wrote quite um, <laughs> interestingly, uh, we are rich enough not that we do, we're rich enough to be inefficient. We cannot continue to, to think that efficiency, which in e economy uh, is also measured by profitability on the bottom line, is necessarily makes very much sense when we have the technology that can produce physically uh, what, um, all that we need, but the one thing it cannot give us is a lot of our own time. So I'd just like to, 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 to return our thinking to Keynes and, uh, and uh, his prediction that his grandchildren could live in a world where they would work only 15 hours a week. We are several generations on and the hours of work have not reduced. The one thing that our system has not been able to deliver to us is more free time. There is nothing, it, it delivers, as I suggested before, more goods and services than are actually needed. Uh, uh, the content of what is produced is, is a byproduct of the politics and the economics of the system. The, the economics being that of um, nothing is produced that is not profitable, it's capitalism and the politics, uh, are equally important, uh, put a very high value on the creation of employment, value for politicians, political value, because it is very much valued by the people. So what is actually produced and how much of it, a lot of it is surplus and it adds to the environmental problem enormously by increasing the throughput of material goods and material waste uh, beyond what is really required. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of uh, more questions, if you'd like to take the microphone. Yes. Uh, you were speaking about land um, economics and the pricing of land. It's very interesting statistics. There is an issue in Latin America, uh, I guess in the world, uh, which you didn't touch, but it's interrelated, and I'd like to see if you know about it and what you know about it, which is um, the occupation of land in order to create habitational space or to create any kinds of community activities and new settlements on <coughs> fragile, <coughs> environmentally uh, sensitive, lands such as is happening in Mexico City, happening in many parts of um, Mexico and many parts of the world, which people are finding a buffer for their survival in environments that are not even ready, um, but that are providing uh, for new forms of activity and human uh, reproduction. And could you, uh, or would you, or do you think it's a relevant question, uh, give us some kind of idea how this is impacting uh, the relationship between the economy and nature, if you have uh, Is that directed anything. to Eugenia in particular? It would or be or? Uh, both uh, or, or any of the two. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so thank you. Well, I, I'm not uh, pretty sure if I understand very well your question, but it is true that in Mexico, especially in Mexico City, we have a problem with a high density of population that we don't have in all around the country. In Mexico, in Mexico City, we have 1,700 1, uh, uh, persons by, kilo, by, kilometer, by, by kilometer square, and also, but all the rest of the country, you can, I don't know, conquer the, conquer the territory with a, 
few people there, let's say Colima or other states of, the, of Mexico, we don't have a really a, a huge population well distributed because of course the economy is not well distributed, the income is not well distributed, and we don't have this, uh, we have a lot of problems with this territorial, uh, uh, how do you say, um, distribution and occupation all, all around the country. But at the same time, I, don't, I think that the, the, ma the major problems in, in about this relationship between population and, and nature environment, it is the, the exploitation of, of course, of oil in the Gulf of Mexico, that maybe it could, it could change the name, but Gulf of the United States, I don't know, <laughs> but maybe, and then, and, and of course, uh, the minery exploitation, which create a lot of, maybe Rodolfo Garcia Zamora can say it, a lot about that, uh, that point. Thank you. Rodolfo, do you want to respond? Eugenia said about the constitutional reform in America Latina to be able the useful application of neoliberalism. This is the case of Mexico. We have a big environmental problem. There are about 300 big national environmental problems as product of the big mining, the big agriculture project, the new producing ener energy of eolic industries, and the capacity of the Mexican state is very reduced because the logic is the logic of the market. And the consequences of these 300 environmental problems are a very big social problem in the south, in the center, in the north of Mexico. So the big challenge next year is what is going to happen with Mexico at the next decade if the model will be the same. And the explanation is the chaos, is the destruction of the nation, the destruction of the environmental, and destruction of the future of the country. Could I have yeah, a word? I, I'd like to suggest that this, that this is one aspect of the fact that what we have arrived at is very different from a capitalist economy of the conventional kind that produces um, products and exploits labor for the sake of making a profit. We are very much into a financialized rentier economy. And I would think financialized being that 20% of the GNP that accrues as income to somebody, whether it's in salaries, in bonuses, in profit, in, in whatever, that produces very little real use value, but a lot of money income, which money income has to be spent or saved or in invested in or whatever against the, pro the production of the real economy, against the productive activities of those sectors of the economy that pr actually produce uh, use values. And, and then we have the, the Ronti, um, if effect uh, that not only uh, of the actual physical land grab, agricultural land, of the uh, what is happening to urban real estate, of the enormous uh, speculation which to drives up the value of that real estate. Uh, we have the extractive uh, activities of, of mining and of um, industrial agriculture, which in many ways uh, collect uh, rent, uh, it's not, and then we have the new phenomenon of, of um, the private ownership of, of, um, of technology, of all the, uh, the, uh, the rents that are collected, and this very much pertains to the information technology, the Silicon Valley effect, because it's, it's all about the ownership of the technology, of the trademarks, and, and the income that derives, the property income, is, a, is of a rental kind. It is not, it is not um, profit as much as it is a, a form of rent. Uh, so I, I, I see a whole, and, and that of course affects the, um, the inequality and the accumulation of income at the top, to the point where a lot of that money doesn't know what, what it can do 
other than <laughs> engage in further financial or, or rent, rent extraction act, activities. And uh, land in that sense is, 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 a, is a real asset which is regarded as a, as a potential source if it is, can be appropriated of, of producing some form of rent. Okay, if I may ask the concluding question before we finish. Um, I'd like to ask Rodolfo, actually, um, about the ongoing or the upcoming NAFTA negotiations. Just uh, yesterday, uh, Christia Freeland, Canada's trade minister, announced Canada's negotiating position, which included incorporating uh, climate change and feminism into the position. Both of these are very uh, uh, noteworthy and, and, and uh, uh, you know, supportable propositions, but uh, against the Trump administration? I mean, what was she smoking? You know, that this, <laughs> this, is going, this is going to go anywhere at all. So um, I guess my, given, given your critique of how disastrous NAFTA has been for Mexico. W w would it, in fact, be a disaster if there was abrogation, if, if NAFTA were to end through this negotiation? Uh, well, this was the first question in the morning with uh, my colleague Margarita Camarena and uh, our colleague of Korea. What is going the impact of the new negotiation of NAFTA? And quickly I answered, they are making the same mistake of the first negotiation in 1992 to 1994. Because they are uh, making the negotiation with asymmetry situation, and they are subordinated. And besides, in the agenda are only the objectives of the big transnational of Mexico and US. And they, they are not considering the impact of employment. They are not considering migration. They are not considering uh, energetic and environmental impact. So if the logic of the negotiation is the same, the impact negative will be deepen how we are producing. And I, uh, I agree in the, the before question. Why we have 12.2 million of Mexican in US? Because the regional economies were destroyed. Because the, the peace and economy is destroyed. Because it's there is not enough employment. 60% of Mexican workers are in informality. And with the NAFTA renegotiation, the same model will be deepening the debt economic model. Okay, uh, on that note, uh, since we have to be at the Mexican consulate uh, within an hour, and we have, some of us have to organize taxis and so forth, I'd like to bring this session to an end. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite an, a round of applause for our speakers. And, and thanks to all those who contributed to the discussion. I know there's some people who have further questions, but you'll have an opportunity to do that at the reception and into this evening. So thank you very much, and thank you to both Concordia University, to the Carl Plani Institute, and, and to Una, most of all, our, our Mexican friends for making this possible. Thank you.